Hi, I'm VB Price. Uh, I'm the editor of the New Mexico Mercury, and I'm here today with my old pal and dear friend, uh, Don McIver, who is the poetry curator of the New Mexico Mercury, the poetry um, wrangler at the, at the Chatter, uh, a, an old-time slammer and slam master uh, who's been on the radio in Albuquerque since the year 2000, doing a wonderful thing called the Spoken Word Hour on KUNM. We're here today to talk about poetry and uh, the status of this art art form in American society and in New Mexico. Uh, Don has been uh, uh, a close analyst of of the scene and and its various movements in New Mexico since around 1998, uh, and we're really happy to have you here with us today. Thanks for having me, Brad. Well, Glad to be here. It's lovely to be surrounded by all these great books. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and really surrounded. You know? <laughs> That's true. That's true. We really are surrounded in here. So uh, I think um, I'd kind of like to begin with the topic that is um, uh, dear to our hearts, which is political poetry, and why it's ostracized or tends to be ostracized in academic settings. What do you think? What do you think that's about? It's funny because I think that the whole subject of political poetry kind of came up again this weekend when I was reading this article about how they're actually um, in Chile they're exhuming Pablo Neruda's right. body, right? And and you know and looking at that and I, I I was with some friends when we were reading that article and I said you know what that tells me that means that tells me poetry matters. God, that's so <laughs> right. was assassinated. Yeah, they're like because they of... want to know why Pablo Neruda exactly died and that's important, you know, <laughs> you know, important. and and I'm always kind of fascinated by the. Um, how political poet poets outside of the United States the big poets are, and why they aren't. We don't have, you know, the poet laureate. We have the poet laureate, but quite often they're not necessarily known as a political poem right. poet. Or even when Billy Collins was the laureate um, during nine eleven, he didn't write a poem. He he was kind of asked to address the topic, but he didn't actually write a poem. He didn't feel like he could really speak for. Um, that tragedy, and perhaps that was a good thing. He read, I think, an Auden poem or something. Right. Yes, he did read that. Yeah, and um, and it and it's as almost as if the contemporary poet poetry is kind of wants to keep its politics out of its art for some reason, and um, seems to be rewarded that way. And I, I I I think it's just kind of a byproduct of the commodification of an art form of, of, mm. of capitalism. And that's what capitalism does, you know, and we are so capitalistic in our consumption of art that anything that dare pushes some sort of uncomfortable boundaries is going to be looked upon by, because I, I do believe it's kind of the marriage of, of, of state and market, you know, the Italian fascism yeah, is, but, you know, is very alive and well. And so anything that pushes some sort of alternate agenda and it's, it's more in America, it's more, um, just don't, instead of, instead of towing a party line, it's more, just don't tow a party line at all. So the, the, uh, this, uh, commodification poetry has, in, has in a lot of ways killed poetry in America, uh, I think, uh, although there have been wonderful revivals and, you know, in, in Incredible efforts to make things work, but but also I'm. I think we were talking a while back about how, in minority communities, particularly, poetry is political, and and indeed the uh, the the personal is political. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and I'm thinking, um, is this is a matter of racism in some sense that that. Uh, that that's uh, way too dangerous uh, to have in in the common marketplace. Yeah, and again, you know, I mean, I find it interesting. I mean, it's, it's you. I mean, it it has its parallels in like jazz, and has its parallels in popular culture. That you know, we had this hip hop movement in the um, in the late eighties, which to me is that poetry re really quickly divorced itself from. 
you know, really said that is not poetry. Yes, right. Yeah. Oh which, boy, <laughs> which yeah. makes no sense to me because yeah. it's like okay, it's it's rhyming couplets most of the time. Yeah. Everyone is raised upon this sort of style of poetry, you know, from Shakespeare, Keats, whatever. All these rhyming couplets, you know, <laughs> and yet here comes this mass um, art form called hip hop or rap. Uh, primarily produced in inner cities and primarily produced by minorities and the establishment wants to say that's not poetry and I'm like well then what is poetry you know and 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 yet it obviously has some sort of commercial appeal because it is one of the major movers and within music and and it always struck me as it's like we we ceded the territory by defining it as not poetry we gave it up to we gave it to music god you know and music took it and said we'll take it we know what to do with this yeah and a lot of people made a lot of money off of it you know that's a great insight <laughs> you know that is so when when uh, when hip hop was banished uh, if you will uh, slam sort of came in behind it uh, and took its niche in a way uh, and it really brought American and New Mexican poetry back to life in a way that it hadn't had in a very very long time I'm I'm always sort of fascinated by the relationship between academic philosophy and academic poetry I know that many of my poets uh, friends you know work in universities in contexts like that and I don't want to be uh, sullying them in any sense but but uh, the people who hire them, I guess, uh, um, uh, they do tend to uh, to look at things lo like philosophers do. They're very, very ingrown, uh, and they and they don't have any any life in the world to speak of. That's a gross generalization, but but then comes slam, man, the whole thing goes, you know, and it's fantastic. Uh, what um, What's happened to Slam? And why don't we hear more about it? Uh, well, when Mark, uh, Mark Smith, um, started the Slam, I mean, he deliberately was was mocking in a lot of ways uh, traditional, more academic-oriented poetry readings where um, him, I think, you know, he would have probably been... Uh, he would have been in vaudeville if he was oh, a couple generations crazy. younger. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a total showman. You know, he likes to perform. He likes to be out there, and he happens to love poetry. And he yeah. never understood why um, why poets didn't factor the audience more into it. Yeah. You know, and he's like, you have people coming to this. Why aren't you giving them something they can appreciate or understand or, you know, yeah. and so. I, I mean, I feel like this is partly where the um, kind of the rate the racial undertones. Mark's a white man. He's a white man in Chicago, a city known for his poetry, and he's getting a lot of attention, calling it a poetry slam, calling it whatever it is. They couldn't ignore him. Right. You know, they couldn't marginalize him in a lot of ways. I mean, they try, and, yeah. and then they have. And it's sort of. Uh, Similar to hip-hop, it sort of filled this sort of niche where people want to have some sort of, I call it authenticity, and um, people want to, you know, know that the art that they're consuming is actually coming from the supposed artist, which is not always easy to tell. I mean, you can listen to anything on Top 40, and, and you're not... Who wrote that song? I don't know. Did Madonna write that song? Maybe not. Maybe she paid somebody to write that song. Is that really her experience? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the po poetry has always kind of filled that real authentic niche where there's sort of this real identification of if you have a a cathartic experience reading that poem, you can probably be sure that the person writing the poem had a pretty similar experience and you have this immediate connection. It's a wonderful connection. That's, right. that's so true, I think. You know. And um, so since it filled that sort of uh, niche and, and got popular because it was filling this niche that, once again, poetry could have kept that territory and... Nice. and seeded it, it it also uh, brought in, I think, elements of Native American storytelling, and it brought in uh, yeah. the narrative tradition and Hispanics, and it yeah. brought in, you know, urban um, hip-hop influence work. It right. brought, brought in all that because it was very 
democratic, for lack of a better word. Mark didn't have this notion of what is good and what is bad, what is poetry and what is not poetry. He's like, get up there. The audience likes it. You'll get to read more. Right. If not. <laughs> yeah. If not, sit back down. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, um, and so that made it kind of successful and made it a fun show. Uh, but like anything, I think it, it, you know, this, once again, this back to capitalism, anything that becomes moderately successful, then people try to figure out how to monetize it and how to commercialize it and commodify it. And so it's become, in my, in my estimation, a, a, a shadow of its former self and a shadow of what it could do. So I can remember as a kid uh, listening to, the, to uh, Cadman recordings of all these wonderful poets, Pound and Alien and this Moore and... They all sounded exactly alike, and they all sounded exactly like all of my English professors. Uh, who were, and I can remember one one professor saying, um, "Well, it is a good poet, but really, he's just a good reader. You know, uh, that's why you like these things so much." So the first time I walked into a slam, I I couldn't believe it. One, I couldn't believe the the youth of the poets and the enormous poise and the training and all all the things that go into it. Um, and I sort of had a, a thought that we were going to see a um, kind of a larger fluorescence that we may even have uh, used uh, uh, electronic media to you know, sort of pull all that out of the internet and you know, do what might be a, you know, a, a kind of video version of a magazine. Uh, uh, I didn't see that yet, but... but uh, of course, what we're trying to do with the Mercury is to simply put poetry in the world along with everything else. And I think it's wonderful that we've been able to do that. And you've got so many wonderful poets uh, already, but they're placed right in the voices. So there's already a sort of an implied politics, mm -hmm. I think. Um, how can we evolve that more, do you think? I mean, is there a way to use the Internet to to expand this art form and to expand its audience? I mean, I, I mean, I think it, it has, it's happening slowly. I mean, I think there's still kind of this barriers to, in, barriers to entry, which is technology in a lot of cases. Is, right. But I mean, I think with YouTube and, and um, I mean, I actually think it primarily because of, of, of YouTube and, and, and very accessible video and audio that was never really accessible before yeah. that, um, the traditional powers that be are having to wrestle with the fact that it may not be enough to be just a good page poet. You may actually have to have some poise. You may have to, <laughs> you know, you may have to read in more than just the monotone. You may have to, you know, that those, those, those skills are, are rewarded when they may not have been before. It didn't matter in, let's say, T.S. Eliot, who's not a great reader. You're a terrible reader. Yeah. Really? <laughs> you're, you're way kind. You're, I'm, I'm kinder than you are. <laughs> um, you know, because he was getting published and people were consuming his work off the page. Yeah, well, now people are finding work in a variety of different ways. They're seeing videos. They're seeing YouTube. They're hearing it. You know they're doing they're going to a live show and so you're starting to I think develop a a vocabulary a discipline which I like to call spoken word it's, yes 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 you know it has a it has a set of that you can study it and you can say and 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 I think that's a good thing in a way that it gives it more credence when you can actually say this person is doing this and this is notice how they're doing this and notice how they do this you know whether they vary their pitch whether they vary their speed whether they vary you know pacing whether whether they're adding a movement to emphasize a certain thing whether the poem is accessible you know and i think that's that's all happening but it of course doesn't happen fast enough in my my estimation if the internet is uh is being consumed primarily by younger and younger audiences. Uh, it's clearly the place for the spoken word to take off as a, I don't mean as an institution or anything that's ossified, because I don't really think it can be, because if you're constantly moving young people in and out, and in, you know, uh, it's going to be more and more lively and cross-cultural things and other things. But 
is is the internet and is it is a kind of a, a a YouTube platform possibly the next sort of poetry magazine? I mean, and do you think there'll be a large number of spoken word outlets with their own slants and their own views and and their own editors? Is that a a real possibility or just a or am I just kind of making that up? <laughs> I mean, I think we there's a couple different challenges that that prevent that, and I think they're uh, they're systemic challenges. And one, I think, um, when you had the rise of magazines, I think in the early 20th century, you also had the people that consume those magazines or whatever. We had a, I think, a much more literate population. Our schools were better. There you go. You know. No, no you're right. You know, and so now we have. Everyone has access to this technology and can put up whatever, but we don't have the same sort of arts education that's been decimated. So True people enough. don't know what's good and bad, you know. And and I'm not sure if I want to get into discussion about what what is good and bad. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a longer topic too. Yeah. But I think there's that sense of everything is just it's so demo, it's so democratized, which I like. But it also at the same time, how do you sort through it all? Right. You know, and there are people that are certainly knowledgeable and could act as um, editors. That's what the function of the editor kind of traditionally has been. But even that, that role has been largely kind of decimated and the money's been taken out of that. So the people who are knowledgeable are being like, well, why would I do that? I'm not going to get paid to do right, that. Right. You know? And so I think the it's, it's arts education and, and the this combination of democratization and, and commodification of everything is really, really, in a way, it's not silenced the great voices, it's, it's, um, it's drowned them out. Yeah. So finding, finding people who are really doing amazing work and really looking at what they're doing and how they're doing it is, is a task in and of itself. So I, I kind of think of, of, political poetry as rising out of struggles of one kind or another. And we seem to be in a rather struggleless period in our country. Not so in Latin America still. But even there, the uh, the uh, terrible anxieties and pressures um, uh, uh, that arose out of the 60s um, just aren't there anymore yet. So I'm, I'm beginning to think that we're going to see a revival of public poetry when uh, struggles return to us, um, which may be a lot sooner than we, uh, than we think. I was always I was always interested in Margaret Randall's uh, El Coro Implomado down in Mexico uh, during the student uh, uh, revolution uh, from the mid-60s to 68, and uh, the enormous number of, of wonderful poets that she managed to publish and and uh, and I think that's all here too uh, I'm just trying to understand what's going to catalyze those voices I'm you know I think we're already you know, uh, beginning to see some really interesting people you particularly I think uh, as a writer Hakeem uh, Bellamy as a writer and and a lot of others too uh, and uh, Levi Romero but there's um uh, but the world doesn't seem to be ready yet uh, for really strong voices. I mean, I, I don't think there's a, a shortage of, of, of strong voices or even a shortage of platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's this, uh, something to me is it, we've, in this, call it whatever, globalization, and I think we have this kind of global consciousness, but that global consciousness um prevents us from really acting on a lot of things because it just seems too big you know and i think uh, why why i like the mercury and why i like uh, regional and local is like well this is where we really could really are going to make the difference yes exactly you know and so the concerns of of my albuquerque community are what i need to kind of address and what i need to look at and what i need to 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 understand and and it's not to say that I'm writing about regional things, but I'm certainly understanding the subjects I'm writing from from kind of a regional perspective sure. or from my personal perspective, which is very much rooted in Albuquerque and rooted in the Southwest and rooted, in my case, um, 
I'm a, I'm a Western kid. I've, I am I've too. No, always too. lived in the West. It's not on California. I'm not not on any coast. I'm, I, mountains are the thing. It's like I always have to know they're there. And uh, what is that? <laughs> what does that look like? And how does that inform the work that I do? And it strikes me as uh, we're going to have challenges. And I think I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the future is, but I feel like this trying to look at all these problems national or global or being having having the only way to tackle these problems as being framed through the guise of New York or Washington oh, DC oh. or Los Angeles is is problematic. It is deeply problematic. Right. Deeply problematic. You no, know, I've long thought that uh, uh, local culture all across the United States has been uh, fundamentally submerged through the New York Times national National TV, through uh, Washington Post, and you know through national outlets. So nobody on a local level really knows what the heck's going on at all in their own hometown. We just were up in Montana and Wyoming. Local newspapers are almost gone. Uh, you certainly would never find a poem in a in a Mountain West newspaper, Billings Gazette, or the or even the Boomerang at uh, Laramie. Uh, but uh, but t to be able to treat a region in a uh, like the New Yorker used to treat the New York, uh, the New York region, you know, or like the nation treats, treats uh, D.C. Uh, is certainly the goal of Benito and I in the in the in the Mercury. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, when are we going to see a whole bunch of, or is it even? I don't even know if we want to see it or not. But a whole bunch of drought poems, or uh, uh, you know, or or deep river stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd love to read that. I mean, I think it, it like it kind of comes back to uh, education in the non-formal sense, right. you know, of getting people to tap to tap into their own own what's happening to them locally, and finding the resources because I think they're out there. But finding you know whether it's talking to your neighbor about what's happening, yeah. you know, and it's this reinvigoration of there is definitely a local vor movement. At least they talk about that in the food right. and local restaurants. And I know my. Um, my wife and I are always thinking about okay when we go out to eat is this a local restaurant is this a chain exactly. you know and 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 so we're always trying to support the locals but I think it has to ripple out beyond that it's like okay so you're gonna buy a book why don't you buy a local author's book yes you know you're gonna buy a record well why don't you go to a local show and buy their buy a record from a local band you know it's just across the board and just this quit passing judgment on whether it's cool or or good or bad or whatever and just like you support local because it's it's your neighbors that's you know you know and that that's what that's what communities do we support our own you know absolutely you know. so always in the past if you were a regional writer or a local writer that was a put down uh i think really um what we need in 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 this state and in this nation really and in this world is a are, are very high, highly focused local artists and analysts looking at at the issues that impact and affect everyone's daily life, the real life, the authentic life, the life that's lived, not the life that's supposed to be. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking now as as we've been talking, I'm thinking uh, this is what this is what you've done in your selection of poetry for us. Uh, and the uh, the way you've curated this wonderful flow of work, uh, uh, these have a kind of a powerful local reality to them. Uh, I mean, even though they're not, you know, they're not sort of uh, militantly so, but they are so real and so beautiful. Uh, um, how do you see uh, the curation of poetry in uh, in the Mercury? evolving over the next uh, year or two yeah i mean it, it, i think curating and and i also had a, a chance to do a, a mini anthology for the ma pais review on jazz poetry and i approached it the same way and i learned this when i was doing the radio show that i, I call it kind of the duende day i don't have like i'm looking for this i just kind of go this feels right yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just that kind of embrace of this this feels like the poem this feels like the when I want to have this person, you know, and and so I don't have like a, a other than the fact I got to I, I have to be wary, be wary of my own kind of perceived biases sure. and um, my own per, my own perception of of 
resist my impulse to publish a lot of people that look like me. <laughs> yes. You know, and so I go, okay, well, so I'm going to vary this. I don't want a whole bunch of middle-aged white men, you know. <laughs> um, and also realize that my taste isn't necessary. It, it's taste. It's sure. just my taste. It isn't the end-all, be-all of what is quality, you know. And um, and you're going to write an essay about taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. working on that. Yes. Um, and that I, I just have to kind of put it out there and trust whatever kind of gut reaction I had to the poem that said, this is the poem. This is the, you know, this is the time, you know. And it's it's not a it's not a left brain analytical thing at all. Oh. It's really, really intuitive and flow and and I want to keep that. I don't want to make it very complicated. I want to keep it pretty simple. Go, that's it. That's the one. And and you may say, well, why this one, Don? And I may go, I don't know. It felt right. You well, know? So really judging by the enormously wonderful response we've had to poems, your gut reaction is really good for our audience and for our readers. And it's been wonderful talking with you today. I really, really appreciate you coming over to the library at the New Mexico Mercury and, and uh, spending time talking about this fascinating world. Thank you, Don. Thank you. It's been great. It's always a pleasure talking with you. It's just wonderful.